Hi everybody, my name is Sajjad and I live in Bangalore, um, India and I work for a company called Development Seed. I don't know if you guys have heard about Development Seed. Um, we're a pretty small team. Uh, we mostly work on Earth observation and satellite imagery data these days um, and work with a pretty wide range of uh, group of people on some of the projects that we think are pretty exciting and I'll quickly run you through. So over the last couple of years, we've kind of focused a lot on processing, analyzing satellite imagery and Earth observation data sets. Um, one of our recent projects has been kind of predicting hurricane estimation, uh, hurricane strength estimation with NASA. Um, we've been looking at uh, changes in satellite imagery over time and how that relates to OSM and how can cities, how can data in cities be better. Uh, we work with the humanitarian open street map team recently to look at map completeness um, and those are some projects and if you come find me later we can talk further but today I want to talk to you about one of our recent projects with uh, with World Bank looking at mapping power grids in three countries so we we're looking at Pakistan Nigeria and Zambia so when I say power grids we're talking about the conventional power distribution uh, network so kind of looks like this um, very standard pylons you will see when you're driving outside your city. Um, the reason why it's important to look at the power grid is because I don't know, I'm sure like you've all pretty read up about the sustainable development goals and one of the most important things that the World Bank calls out in their state of electricity access report is that um, access to electricity kind of touches on many other sustainable development goals that has impact on health, education, food security, poverty eradication, gender equality, and things like that. And uh, most of the time, when people, when researchers do sort of estimation of how fast electricity demands can be met over the, over the course of many years, over the course of uh, the estimated increase in population, um, it's not looking that great. So for instance, even by 2030, uh, sub-Saharan Africa is not going to be able to meet their electricity demands because of the growth in population. Now, the tricky situation here is that most of these data sets about how the distribution happens, where are the existing areas that have distribution, are kind of, look, kind of looks like this. So it's either owned completely by private entities or you know, have maps like this that are stored in offices which d never see the light of the day. Um, and it's quite hard to do this kind of analysis. Um, so this is uh, Zambia. It's a pretty intricate map of the distribution, but it's really hard to kind of run analysis on top of this unless you do a lot of georeferencing and things. Um, OpenStreetMap um, does a reasonably good job of actually, uh, there are some people who actually like mapping these things. Um, so there are over 10 million nodes that are tagged as pylons, uh, which is power equals tower. Um, so just like you know, most of our work, we wanted to map this in OpenStreetMap to do more geography-based distribution and research like that. Um, there is a problem. So this is somewhere central Pakistan. Um, there is a pylon in this image, and this is about zoom 13. So not so far away, but can anyone see? Right? It's somewhere over there. Let's zoom in. Kind of, can you see? It's like this is zoomed like 16. So these things are really hard to see. And this is, we're talking about like Pakistan, this is mostly desert, like desert, uh, desert and you know, there's not many other features around this area, and it's still very hard to see these things. Um, some more examples, and these are further down, so this is like zoom 16, zoom 17, um, and it's still kind of pretty hard to see. And some of these, if you go into mapping these features, it could be very time consuming. Now let's kind of look at the scale of the country. So uh, most of the time, if you want to map these kind of high resolution features, you would want to zoom your editor down to zoom 18, and ID only lets you start mapping at zoom 16, for instance, right? So if you want to map all of the power grid in Pakistan, you'll be kind of looking through over 50 million tiles. 
for Nigeria, about 40 million, and for Zambia, about 34 million. Um, that's quite a bit of work. Um, so we've, we've really been interested in sort of looking at how we can help map faster in OpenStreetMap um, and not to necessarily replace um, the people in OpenStreetMap or the mappers in OpenStreetMap. And this could get, I mean, I know that this has been a slightly political topic over the last many months. Um, people have tried many things. We've, you know, all gone through processes of figuring out what best practices are there. Um, but I think it's still very well established that humans do a better job in actual mapping in OpenStreetMap than machines at the moment. This could change. Um, but right now, it's still a better way to have people look at the map and edit and make changes, right? And we've had instances where things have been um, not so good. Um, we've talked about artificial intelligence, and we've talked about how that could actually help OpenStreetMap and make people map faster, or we could fill up gaps in OpenStreetMap much faster and things like that. Um, and depends on what end of the spectrum you are in terms of quality and speed, um, you could kind of disagree or agree with me, right? So what we've been kind of advocating a lot is um, this concept called intelligence augmentation, which goes very well and along with artificial intelligence. Um, intelligence augmentation is essentially using machines to sort of help human beings make decisions better and not necessarily try to make machines compete with human beings. And I'm not a machine learning engineer or don't have any expertise in that space, so um, you know, you're welcome to uh, debate. So what we wanted to do, um, so these features are pretty hard to map. They take a lot of time. They're also pretty, you know, you could mess up the map a lot if you were to let um, the machines map themselves. So what we wanted to do is to use machine learning approach to find areas on the map where there's a high probability of these pylons that exist on satellite imagery. And then we would identify them and then let the human beings or the mappers look at um, and then trace them out. Uh, questions so far? Disagreements? Everybody with me? OK, OK. Um, so we kind of started doing standard machine learning approach. We uh, went through thousands of images based on the data that's already in OpenStreetMap, looking at different parts of Pakistan, Nigeria, and Zambia. Um, took out a lot of training data set that uh, kind of looks like, a lot of it looks like this, right? Just many map tiles, uh, many silent imagery tiles, which has a pylon or more. So we built this sort of model that's based on existing convolution models, model called exception. And um, so you can see that little patch. So first Pakistan, um, Zambia, and Nigeria. Um, and you can see like the, the inset, this, the image on the right kind of shows like what parts that we used as the training data set. So you can see those lines kind of connect the distribution network, right? Um, we ran this model over many of those million tiles in all these countries. And we were able to come up with a set of tiles where there's a potential, there's a probability of pylons that exist. And this kind of brings down the amount of tiles that you have to look at uh, by human eyes drastically. Um, so this is, again, central Pakistan. And I'm just browsing the map. And you can see in the red squares, uh, there's a pylon. Can you guys see that? So this was actually pretty interesting, except for there were a bunch of problems. So, so this is kind of the prediction um, across Pakistan. So each black dot represents um, one pylon or a tile with a pylon. Now, so you can see like on the, the, the arrow on the left, which is more kind of eastern, you can see the lines kind of show up really well, right? So it connects the, the dots connect the power grid. But more central, more east, uh, uh, more west, uh, more eastern, you can see there's like a big blob of like black dots. Um, that's mostly because our training data sets weren't exactly the best. Um, the same kind of features the, could be distributed across different terrain and could have different signals based on um, what area you're looking at, right? And for us, that was like a 
big problem, um, which meant that there were a lot of false positives like this, but it still uh, got us to a good point where we could start mapping a lot of the country. Um, so in the end, we came up with this data set of just squares where we think there are potentially um, pylons. And then sort of like threw them into Task Manager, just like what we would do when we wanted to do mapping. So we created a Task Manager job per country, um, added the prediction layer into Task Manager. So we, did, we made very basic modifications to Task Manager. Um, integrated that, so, sort of opened each of those tasks in, in JASM, and then went through each tile. Um, and in the end, we just kind of like trace them out. So this is essentially the tracing process where, where you're really kind of only looking at the boxes where we think there is a pylon and then just sort of tracing them out. Um, and I think like the bigger point, and I don't want to get too technical into the machine learning side or the training data sets and the, and the diversity of the data set, which are all in itself kind of separate talks. Um, and the point that I want to kind of get across is that this was a pretty good experiment where we were able to do this kind of mapping in a much, much faster way. And um, we did, before we started doing the machine learning approach, we wanted to look at what we benchmark this against. And um, we were actually quite amazed by this 33 times per hour um, rate. And I think, I think we were able to do, to map large parts of the electricity grid network in Pakistan. So this is Pakistan, um, in Nigeria and Zambia um, in sort of a very short period of time without having to, you know, ch get a change of glasses or, um, you know, have to hire more people or not losing our minds. Um, now, I think there are, for us, like, there, I guess there are many lessons from this. and. I think two of the big ones. Uh, one is that so the diversity of the training data sets, and that OSM does a really good job, and OSM has that amount of data set, uh, that amount of data that you could actually diversify how you would use your, uh, how you would create your training data sets for for machine learning algorithms, and um, it's something that a lot of lot of people in the a lot of people in the OSM have been advocating. So you should definitely kind of talk to them and figure out what kind of best practices are. Um, and I guess like the second big thing was um, we had to run this prediction over many million tiles and, you know, without kind of ending up with like massive AWS bill. Um, so that was like an interesting problem solved, figuring out how to batch process these tiles and uh, from the infrastructure standpoint. Um, Yeah, I'll stop here and sort of take questions or comments and conversation if anybody's um, up for it. You should be able to hear me okay. Yes, absolutely. How is the first hours needed to develop a machine learning algorithm in Python compared to the first hours of the sequential Yeah, totally. Great question. So um, we had two people on the machine learning side who were building the model looking at the training data sets, looking at the infrastructure, and we, had a, we have an eight people mapping team. Um, and it, you know, it just doesn't add up because th these models, so exception is like a pretty popular machine learning approach, it exists. Um, we needed, the time that we needed to, I think like between collecting training data sets, training the model, and preparing the prediction, preparing the prediction was the most time consuming for us because it needed to run over a period of time on computers, um, but it's still much faster than eight people spending months looking at each of these tiles, and would be a lot more expensive. Any other question? Oh, sorry. So you talked about that you have a lot of false positives in your data. Do you also know about how many false negatives are in there? So yeah. How many power lines you may, might miss? Yeah, so I wish I had, I wish this, uh, maybe this GIF still has some more. 
So there were false negatives, especially in kind of where like some, some sand dunes got picked up because of the shadow that looked like a pylon, for instance. Um, they, yeah, and I think, I think there were a lot more false positives than, than negatives, uh, just because the, the way the terrain kept changing and we just didn't include such a diverse um, data set. Did you also make a distinction between uh, high voltage power lines and pylons and lower voltage stuff? Because you can't, obviously you can't see it from your aerial images, but maybe there was, is, is, was it verified uh, with other data that you had about these networks? Right, so I think this, was, this started out as becoming a high voltage power grid mapping. Um, and then we also included substations and transformers in the end, so we could kind of figure out what's high voltage and what's not. Um, so we did that towards the end, and not very successful, but still, you know, it's really hard to identify substations yes. from other buildings. So, but, so, but, so that data was finally included, more or less? Totally, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and once you start mapping, this is where it actually makes it more interesting for people to map, because then once you start kind of drawing the grid together, you know that you know the terrain goes, you know how what you know what path it follows and all that. It was pretty exciting. Hi. It seems at some point you come into conflict with the commercial providers who are building these power networks. Does anybody ever answer this? Because we're building a public version of what somebody already made a drawing and a map of for their business purposes? Oof. That's a pretty large open street map question. Um, I think I can imagine this having many levels of conflict of interest and potential uh, liability. But uh, these are actual things that you can see and verify on the ground. So I'm just going to use that OSM card and be like, you know, it exists, so we could map. <laughs> Are you one of those people who we may have a potential conflict with? <laughs> yeah. I like the idea of doing that. Totally, yeah. I just wonder at what point, is, is there a point where somebody comes to you and says, you shouldn't be doing that, that's our network? Or right. where somebody else comes to you and says, well, actually, dude, I've, I've actually got a map in my pocket of what we built last year. You could do this without all the work. Sure, yeah. I mean, I guess that's true for many features in OSM that, that gets mapped, right? And um, what we can see, we map. More questions? I think you're quite right. I mean, that conflict exists uh, all, all the time. Uh, there used to be a public domain data set or, or a data set put out for the public of all telecommunication masts in the UK. And uh, one of the major telecommunication companies pulled its data from that data set and they said, we are fed up with contributing to a data set, the main purpose of which is to object to us putting up telecommunication masts. Uh, now, it, it, that's the point at which mapping becomes political and I think that if one starts with exactly the principle you've suggested, that if it's there and you can see it, you can map it and nobody can stop you, is absolutely the right point to come from because even if the manager of the electrical network says we will feed you our data he moves on next manager comes along and says he shouldn't have done that we're going to take it away so i, I think the, there's room for the two but saving time through imports uh, at times when the data is available also strikes me as being a good idea but you need a plan b i think what you've described is a good plan b Yeah, uh, I, I would like to uh, hook in on this uh, question because I, I'm from the Netherlands and in the Netherlands the, maintain the maintainer of the rail railway network in the Netherlands 
uh, ProRail company, uh, who is actually uh, largely state-owned, uh, actually imported part of uh, their railway network, including uh, catenary masts, and uh, they also were, at least I know, they were contemplating adding the power lines as well, so for the railway system. And it, this is, actually we had this kind of interesting or conflicting situation where the company at some point was adding data with text that we didn't actually use like that in OSM uh, because it just showed up, because just make it a power line and it shows up, but it's a it's different kind of system and the catenary masts are not the normal pylons that you see. Uh, uh, so it was a kind of conflicting and uh, it, 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 but it was actually the opposite of what you're suggesting that the comp that we as uh, editors or OSM editors are adding at the data. Instead, the company was importing the data or adding data because they had a strong interest in this. It was actually quite an uh, interesting story because at one point one one of those people actually wrote that they used it the OpenStreetMap data as a kind of base map because it was easier to access than some of their own web services. <laughs> so, yeah, so I think that also highlights a potential problem that uh, government agencies may at some point in the future try to get kind of hold of part of the data because that's in their interest. And there's, so you can have the, I actually just want to illustrate that you can have the opposite situation where, this, where the, these, these kind of organizations actually uh, try to, well, more or less dictate what, how it should be in, in OSM, whereas you want the power for that, of course, still to be at the, in the, at the community level and not uh, by some state company. So it's, it's just an illustration of what can happen in this, this kind of conflict situation. Thank you very much.